wonder why I can't hear anything. Welcome, everyone. Hello. 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 Hi there. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday, everybody. You too. All right, Arlene, do you think we're good to get started? Yes, they were good. Great. Well, welcome everyone and happy Thursday. Um, we're here um, at our EDI water cooler and our topic today is inclusion in your tech transfer office. And so we have a, a couple different things planned for today. We're gonna start off with a little Quizlet based on the EDI toolkit. And then we're gonna move into a discussion based on the various sections of the toolkit um, and talk about how you can apply what's in the tool toolkit to making your office more inclusive. And we're really hoping that this will be an interactive discussion. Uh, we have some guests with us today. We have Kara Maples, who's the immediate past chair of the EDI committee. We have um, Nargis, who's our um, incoming chair, we have Anin Dingus, and we have Ann Hall. And so feel free to um, participate today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So as I mentioned, we're going to start things off with a quick little quizlet here based on the EDI toolkit. So uh, let's see how everybody does. And feel free to put your answers into the chat. So the, oops, that was a bonus question now for everybody. So the first question is true or false. And it's based on um, a research study and which was entitled, Who Becomes an Inventor in America? The study of innovation published in 2019 found that innovation would triple if women, minorities, and children from low income families became inventors at the same rate as men from high income families. And so as I kind of goofed a little bit there and showed you the answer, uh, you get bonus points if you know what the actual answer is here. Anybody have any thoughts? It is, it is false, I see five times. And yes, the answer is it would quadruple. That is the answer. So um, innovation would quadruple if women, minorities, and children were given the um, same opportunities um, as men from high-income families. All right, moving on to the next question. This one's multiple choice. So from the list below, can you identify what the three objectives of the Autumn EDI toolkit are? And I'm gonna give everybody a second to read these and then put your answers in the chat. All right. Do we have one answer there that says AED? <laughs> Someone said I can make a good argument for all of them. A, another one, ADE. All right, so let's take a look. So if you said ACE, those are actually the three objectives that are recited in the EDI toolkit. But I agree with you, there are arguments for uh, B and D as well. All right, another multiple choice. And this question comes out of the very first section of the toolkit that has to do with implicit and unconscious bias. And I'm sure you're all familiar with implicit and unconscious bias. It's uh, 
associating various stereotypes or attitudes sort toward certain categories of individuals without you being consciously aware of it. And this impacts our everyday life. And it's perfectly normal. We all have unconscious bias. So there are things called the implicit association tests that help you identify what your unconscious bias are. And these tests basically assess whether there's a mental link between concepts and potentially associated values. And Harvard has a whole list of implicit association tests that can be used to determine individual bias. So if you're at the toolkit, uh, if you're familiar with the Harvard implicit association test, which of the below is not an implicit association test offered by Harvard? E, I see E and F, E, C, D and H, C, F. Okay, a lot of really good answers there. So E and F, okay. So actually the answer is C and H. So it's basically body piercings and tattoos and accents. There are implicit association tests for presidents, believe it or not, that was added um, after, uh, after the last few elections. There are implicit association tests uh, for weapons as well. Um, there's actually a whole slew, I think it's up to 15 um, implicit association tests. So definitely worth checking those out if you haven't done so already. So here's another true and false question. I'm not, not going to give away the answer uh, this time. Um, this one actually comes from the second section of the toolkit and involves measure, which involves measuring impact, research data, and benchmarking. So here, true or false, when beginning to develop EDI initiatives and programs, it's important to identify the desires, desired outcomes for your organization. And do a good and a good place to start is by striving to understand the demographics of your office, as well as those submitting invention disclosures, and or starting new companies by race, ethnicity, gender, ability, veteran status, age, etc. So is that true or false? True. Okay, we're getting both answers in here. Actually, that is true. So definitely um, when you're beginning your initiatives and your programs, and this will be something we'll talk a little bit more here shortly, um, it's really important to, to know what your outcomes or objectives are um, before you begin. So next Question, question five is a multiple choice. And this comes from the section three of the toolkit and it has to do with building your system. And here we talk in the toolkit about best practices in the diversity toolbox. And there's a diagram in this section that has to do with EDI strategy and system continuum. So really understanding where your organization is on the EDI continuum. And that continuum is based on five different levels. They go from one to five. And so the question is out of A, B, and C, what is the correct order of those levels going from one to five? So I'll give everybody a second to read this. See some C's, C B. <laughs> Someone wrote, this is bringing me back to my SAT. Well, that's good. I see a lot of C's and a lot of B's. And if, if you did say C, you are absolutely correct. You start out at baseline, move to understanding, application, integration, and transformation. So we're almost at the end of our little quizlet here, um, multiple choice. Um, which of the below is not a best practice to have in your diversity toolbox? C. 
see a lot of C's, I see D. All right. So if you said C, you're absolutely correct. That's generally something you do not want to do. It's definitely not a best practice to ask under underrepresented individuals to take the lead in your EDI efforts. So quick bonus question, and then we're gonna wrap up the Quizlet and move on. Uh, who was the first woman to practice law in the United States? This actually is mentioned in the toolkit. <laughs> Someone wrote, I actually looked this up, Lisa, and forgot. Well, at least you're thinking about it, which is good. Yes, very good. There's several of you did get a good job. It was Arabella Mansfield. And the reason why I bring this up is we talk about the Rooney rule and the Mansfield rule in the toolkit. And um, this Mansfield rule uh, is named after her and it was named in an effort to try and address the diversity issues that exist in law firms and so law firms that agree to participate um, and adhere to the Mansfield rule agree to commit to considering at least 30 percent historically underrepresented lawyers whether they're women people of color LGBTQ lawyers lawyers with disabilities for positions of leadership and other roles within their firm. And just a fun fact, there's a couple comments. You can see Florence King was the first woman to practice patent law. And um, thank you, Megan and Nargis for putting in the link to the toolkit in the chat. So how'd you do? So if you got five to six answers and or the bonus correct, you are a toolkit rock star. Great job. If you got three to four answers correct, you did very, very well. Um, you might want to go back and review the sections that maybe you're less familiar with. And if you only got a couple, one or two answers correct, um, please go ahead and, and take a, another look at the toolkit um, and let us know if you have any questions. So good job, everybody. Based on the comments, everybody did very, very well. So at this point, we are going to switch gears and we are going to move into uh, an act, more of a discussion about how to make your tech transfer office more inclusive. And as I mentioned, we're going to use the various sections of the toolkit as a guide. And so I'm going to kick things off with the first section. We had the little, we had the question involving implicit bias. And one of the topics, um, oh, Someone just asked if uh, where can they find the toolkit? There's a couple links in the chat for you um, to take a look and it's also available on the Autumn website as well. So we're gonna take a look at, um, I'm just gonna talk real briefly before turning this over to some others, but we're gonna talk about um, ways that perhaps in your office, you can um, remove unconscious bias maybe in your invention evaluation and in your patent decision-making process. And some of the most common ways you can try and reduce and hopefully eliminate some point implicit bias in your invention disclosure and your review process is very simply you can try and make your invention disclosure forms when they come in anonymous. You can do this by having someone in your office take out an inventor's name and using a, a, a coding system. Um, other individuals that I know in some offices say that they've actually trained themselves um, not to look at inventor names uh, on a disclosure form or they have inventor names on a separate sheet of their disclosure form and they um, basically just flip the page over without looking at them. But that's one very good way without looking at names to avoid unconscious or implicit bias with your invention disclosures. And I'd be curious to know if other people have had uh, other experiences or other suggestions on how to uh, maybe make their invention disclosures um, anonymous. 
The other thing is when you're reviewing these invention disclosures that come in, uh, mix up and have a diverse uh, group of individuals who are reviewing the disclosures. Uh, diversify your patent review committee. Also diversify the outside counsel that you use. Um, that will also help uh, with uh, reducing unconscious bias as well. Um, be curious now, I wanted to open up. Um, yeah, so a uh, great comment in the chat from Megan, you know, and other ways to put the inventor name at the very end. Um, and that's probably better than what I've seen, which is on the first page and then you flip it over. Um, that's a really great suggestion. But I'd be curious to know if any other individuals have had success <clears throat> in making invention disclosure forms or their patent review process anonymous in their office. Lisa, I, I don't work on that side of things, but I was wondering, could you please explain why making them anonymous would, would be a good thing? I know that our licensing managers work very closely with our researchers, so it, why would taking the name off help in any way? Why would making it anonymous help? Sure. I think sometimes uh, there is a tendency when disclosures come in from certain PIs that there's a tendency that you're always necessarily going to file. You're always going to take that invention from that, that PI, um, regardless of what it is. And maybe you're expending resources for that particular individual and maybe not on another individual. So that's primarily where I've seen the reason for making disclosures um, anonymous. And then I'm looking to see here. I think it would be interesting to make it anonymous if you're like a small company and you don't really have uh, a lot of uh, resource behind you, but it's still a great invention. And compare that to like a huge organization with a lot of resources and see um, you know, what the interest level is in tech transfer. So I've had that experience. You know, I'm, I run a small company, I'm an inventor, but I have a very important invention, uh, I have a patent and the technology um, really serves humanity in an important way. But I haven't had much success. And I've always thought that if I, was, if I had more resources, if I was a larger institution, it I'd be much more successful. So for that reason, I think um, you know, making it uh, private would be interesting to see how that turns out. And what? also, I'd like to uh, share that there has been extensive research on this topic. Um, and I think the very first research goes back to the fact that many years ago, um, most of the first chairs in the orchestra, in orchestras around the country, around the world, were all men. And um, so orchestras actually started doing blind additions. And after they started doing blind additions, the representation in the orchestras actually became very equal in terms of men and women. There's also been similar research done with patent applications that go into patent attorneys. And when the name of the inventor is not included, um, men and women are moved forward in the application process equitably, but when the name is the first thing you see, there is implicit bias um, about gender. And so I, I think there may be other people um, in the water cooler who have other examples, but I but there is very real world research that um, supports the importance and the value of anonymous application. Well, and, and one quick thing I was going to offer is in our patent committee um, evaluation process, we used to have this, um, the standard of asking, well, is the person well funded? And, um, and that, and, and, and are they funded to continue? And I encouraged us to stop that because we were just helping the rich get richer. And we know that there is huge bias in funding. And so we were just amplifying that. So. And I also think 
Aaron Kelly made a great comment um, in the chat about, in addition to anonymous reviews, providing some criteria to evaluate so it's open and understandable. Um, and so I think that was a great comment as well. So every disclosure is getting the same review, same level of review. So Aaron, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add on top of that. Sorry, you working on mute. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I have. Uh, I'm I'm a consultant that works with tax transfer offices in the EDI space, working to implement some uh, best practices. And so, um, I am a part of a project in New Jersey called the New Jersey Equity and Commercial Commercialization Collective, and um, that's one of the things that we've been working on with those offices. Is uh, you know. Inclusive data collection has been our primary focus, but um, being able to really understand how, how you are evaluating, like what is your framework, what is your methodology, um, so, so that people can also understand when they're ready, what they need to be able to speak about and flesh out, because most researchers who are coming in, they're, they're, they're scientists and they're, they haven't um, really spoken yet the the language the vocabulary of commercialization um so if we can meet them there then they can meet us absolutely anybody have any other comments about invention disclosures or invention review processes i just had one question for ann when you remove the funding from the criteria for moving forward with an application what was the ultimate outcome when it was time to further move on with the technology? Were they advanced or um, did you end up not taking action because they didn't have the resources to further advance the technology? Well, that's a great question. Cause yeah, you don't want to end up one year, you know, from that date and then they just simply can't continue. Actually, what we've done is we've focused, we haven't quantified the differences in, in what's happened in terms of outcome. But what we've done is we've made an effort to create gap funding programs um, in the meantime that fund those people who don't have the funding to continue it. And so we've really, and, and tried to make sure we're doing that in a very inclusive way. Thank you. I, have a, I have a quick comment about like, um, I think this is a great concept and I have so much it's hard to incorporate into an office when you kind of know everybody and know their research area. But one, I, that's why I liked Aaron saying, you know, in addition to that, you know, make the criteria clear, make it welcoming. And I know talking to a patent examiner friend, she was pretty adamant you can't examine a patent without knowing who it is because that's the first thing they do to look for prior art. So I just think we have to think about this is it's ideal for musicians we can incorporate bits of this, but I like expanding beyond it too and other things we can try because I just don't think it's pragmatic in every situation in what we do. And Jennifer, that's a great point. And one of the things we addressed in a paper that we put out a few years ago is to make sure that you're aligning with the metrics of the institution. So if you have 30% of your College of Engineering is female, and you're only getting 10% of disclosures who are female, then you can intentionally take the data that you have and use it to go after the missing individuals. Um, another thing to think about is, are you driving new innovators or are you just getting the same people coming to your office over and over? And if you are getting those same people, can you incentivize them to bring somebody else along? Actually, you're, oh, I was just going to say, Megan's comment made me realize in the last few years we've implemented, we have very um, specific metrics and goals in our office, and we've implemented specific metrics and goals around pulling in new innovators into our ecosystem. So we are very intentionally saying we're not, we're going to continue to work with, of course, the people we have, but we must be pulling in new people. That's great. Great. Okay. 
I'm going to move on to the second section, which is measuring impact research data and benchmarking. And I'm going to turn this over to Anne, who's going to talk to us about some of the work that she and others at the University of Minnesota have been doing uh, in this area on research data and benchmarking. So Anne. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you can go ahead and put up the first slide. I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes so I don't go over. Um, I just want to say I'm going to be talking today about work that we've done to, to try to get the autumn community to be collecting legal sex data and other demographic data on university inventors to improve the inclusion and the diversification of the innovation ecosystem. I'm just showing um, several of my collaborators who aren't here today, Faru Garamani and Laura Shapi. Next slide who helped tremendously in this work. So why should you care about measuring the legal sex of your innovators? Well, I'm part of the Women Inventors Special Interest Group, and I also want to encourage um, anybody on this commit or on this call who's interested in join joining us, we would love to have you. And um, Autumn in 2015 started having two questions on their um, Autumn survey that asked about women's involvement in invention disclosures and new patent filings, because we had a hypothesis that we weren't seeing uh, similar numbers out of male and female innovators. So these two questions here at the bottom are, are how it's worded on the autumn survey, how many um, invention disclosures included at least one woman on the disclosure form, and how many new patent applications filed included at least one woman on the application. And so part of what I am going to show you today is two resources that we've put together for you to try to um, make it easier for offices to collect this information or access this kind of information so you can easily um, comply with these questions and answer these questions. And we hope the community can not only measure a baseline of where we all are, but the idea is to spur improvement. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a very quick executive summary of some of the data that we looked at um, in the um, autumn, uh, in the first six years of the autumn survey. And I guess the third point down or the, um, oops, if, uh, do, do, oh no, never mind, you've got it. Um, the, the third point down is kind of the summary, but what we discovered was that the majority of invention disclosures and new patent filings from nearly 200 institutions over a six uh, year period did not include a single woman, not one. So the actual numbers were 32% of invention disclosures included at least one woman and 21% of new patent filings included at least one woman. We would have not have known that if we did not measure it. And now we have a baseline for our improvement and we can target these areas and um, find solutions to these challenges. So on the Women Inventors Committee and, and our metrics subgroup, we're focused on strengthening efforts um, to increase women's participation, sharing practices and tracking improvement. So how do you do that? So go ahead with the next slide. We have two resources um, that we put together and we presented these at autumn last year and we're going to, they're, we're working with Autumn to get them on the Autumn website. That is a little bit of a slower process at this point because naturally they want to vet things, which makes sense. Um, so in the meantime, we can send these resources to all of you. Um, but the very first um, piece of information is a step-by-step -step high level summary for how to collect legal sex data. So, um, and this gets at looking at um, how many women are involved in your innovation ecosystem. And somebody asked a very good question um, or made a comment uh, about, I think it was uh, collecting information or reporting on non-binary. That's a great, um, that's a great point and something we're definitely aspiring to. At this point, we decided to um, start very, um, sort of the simplest level of measuring uh, legal sex. So we are not actually asking about gender identity. It's asking about women's involvement, which stems from male, female. So we're looking at that dichotomy right now. Um, so back to this step-by-step -step summary. Um, we've got a two-page summary that's shown here on the left. And basically it gives an overview of the process of how we recommend tech transfer offices um, obtain legal sex data. 
and the pros and cons of those multiple approaches. You can ask it on the invention disclosure form. You can access it from the HR database at the university. Or another methodology we talk about in our guide is um, connecting with WIPO. And I think Elodie is on this call. She works with WIPO and they have a um, uh, what they call a gender prediction software that uses the first name of inventors to predict male or female status. So um, you can connect with myself or Elodie and we can um, help you access that. And then we also talk in this guide, in this two page guide about a discussion of legal sex, uh, male and female versus gender identity and actually giving some um, recommended ways to ask that question of inventors because I know a lot of um, folks are concerned that they might not approach that in the right way or they might ask the question in a too limiting of way. And so we provide some guidance there. Um, go ahead to the next slide, Lisa. And then, um, <clears throat> and then, in addition to that two page guide, we also have our in depth guide. And um, this is really the, this is a 16 page document. So you can read it if you're, um, if you're struggling to get to sleep at night. Um, but this gives the real detailed information um, and nitty gritty on some of the challenges we faced at our, our respective institutions in trying to collect and report on demographic data. Um, and again, we're working to get this on the Autumn website and make it available um, for everybody because myself um, included, it took me about five years at my institution. Part of that was I was new and I, um, I was taking no as an answer probably a little bit too readily in my younger days. <laughs> um, but then uh, I stopped taking that for an answer and actually figured out a path forward of how we could look at this data. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, please. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So one of the one of the real um, powers of this data for us is that we've been able to dispel some um, myths at our institution, and we've also been able to target areas for improvement. So one of the things that I discovered when I first started this um, process is we were starting to. Uh, report to leadership that we had low involvement from women. That's what our the autumn questions were telling us. We had low involvement from women and participation on invention disclosures and new patent filings. And the prevailing answer I got, well, well, isn't, isn't that just a pipeline issue? We just don't have enough women to work with. And I thought, hmm, I don't, I don't know that that's true. So what we did was we actually um, did a much more detailed analysis and we kind of decided to look at what is the possible number of women we could be working with in six different colleges across the university shown here. And then what was the actual number of women we were working with? Um, and what we saw is that in many of these colleges, like for example, uh, the medical school on the bottom left or vet med on the bottom right, you can see that when you look across those colleges, the actual number of male and female researchers is, is fairly equal. The one real major outlier was our College of Science and Engineering, which um, of course we see a lot of inventions from them and they actually are working hard to diversify, which is great. Um, but many of these other colleges had close to 50-50. And then we could see the actual number of women that were submitting invention disclosures and new patents um, in, the, in the rows uh, below are much lower than the actual numbers we could be working with. And so that was very powerful to, for us to be able to show university leadership and to um, be able to target different colleges and talk to them about what are some ways that we can get um, uh, have a more inclusive innovation ecosystem. And so um, with that, I want to encourage all of you to be um, participating in the autumn survey in those two questions. They are now required questions um, in terms of how many women are involved are uh, listed on invention disclosures and new patent filings. And um, if you're running into challenges at your institution with how to access that data, please um, look at those resources that we've created and we're happy to talk to you um, and help you through those hurdles so that you can participate and 
the end goal is to um, assess where you're at and then track improvement over time. Thank you, Anne. And just a quick follow-up question. In view of this data that you collected, did you take some active steps to try and increase the number of women that were submitting invention disclosures? Yeah, we've done a lot of things so far. Um, we're taking kind of a multifaceted approach. Um, and that has included everything from creating gap funding that is targeted um, at projects that might just need a little bit of a, um, you know, a boost to get over a hurdle. Um, to sort of changing our philosophy about what we expected from inventors, especially first time inventors, um, and focusing on less of a let's be critical and they must be perfect right away to, you know what, it's okay um, if they don't know about how to do this or they're not, um, they're not experienced, let's we're here to train them and to help them learn. So that's been an approach. And then also, as I mentioned, our actual goals of pulling in um, innovators that have not worked with our office before. And many of those are women and underrepresented innovators. And so this data is 2018. Have you seen any movement in your numbers? Well, that's what I'm working on this year is to assess that. Yes, I'm very, very curious if we're starting to see improvement. So hopefully I'll be presenting at Autumn at some point to say, look at our improvement. But uh, as of now, I can't tell you. And can you, uh, I don't know if you all are doing it, but do you all collect the data on licenses as well? So all these patents, actually being used to create something that goes on the market? We haven't gotten there yet. We also did try, one of the areas that I really wanted to look at was our startups, because when we started this in FY18, I really felt like I was not seeing a lot of women involved in our startup ecosystem, and that was really troubling to me. And um, and so we were trying to track this with startups as well. It it is difficult to track with startups because you know how fluid they are and how they're changing all the time. And when do you actually, when is the time that you pick to actually make that assessment? Is it at the license execution? Is it at launch? Is it at, you know, when is it? But that's another area we've been trying to look at. <clears throat> and did, have you tried the USPTO database called Patent View? Um, I have used that, yes. Yeah, because uh, that's an important resource, and you can um, divide your search by, you know, areas of the country, and you can uh, divide your search by technologies, and mm, so I think mm -hmm. that'd be very useful for what you're trying to accomplish, which is very good. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any comments on what Anne presented or thoughts they'd like to share? Just have a small question. Um, I see that uh, woman percent in most of these charts is the lowest. Okay, so how to push? How to uh, encourage them to uh, innovate and uh, come and have the courage to present their ideas? As I think, um, a lot of moments women have uh, uh, have an, a great idea, but uh, don't have the stomach to present it. So how could we? Yeah, I think that's a great question. One of the things that we've tried to do is, I mean, that's why diversifying your um, tech transfer office is really important. I think that some in innovators will feel more comfortable um, potentially talking to somebody who looks like them or that might they might feel they would be more understood. Um, that's one approach. But also, I think um, I think that like we've worked to sort of like change and broaden our view of like what's a possible invention that might have commercial potential. I think we in the past have taken too strict a, a narrow of a viewpoint. And we were missing people and not encouraging people. And so now our approach 
is a lot more about focused on encouragement, not selecting who's the best, but encouraging. And the other thing, there's an interesting conversation going on in the chat about the, the way you talk with women about commercialization, because women typically are not thinking about it in the same way as men. And it has been shown that women are definitely much more interested in the impact they're getting from their research and the, and the opportunity to increase impact. Um, so I do think that it's very important to be um, assessing how you're when you when you're actually um, interacting with women scientists and faculty and researchers um, to understand that they may not be thinking about patenting, they may not be thinking about commercialization. Um, just as the one participant said, you know, women can be a little bit more uncomfortable with those kinds of topics because it's not as familiar to them. But when you talk about their research and their passion for what they're doing, you get a lot more enthusiasm, a lot more excitement about exploring different avenues. And so I do think that is something that um, all um, offices should be considering in terms of how you communicate what your messaging is. Thanks, Karen, yep. Great point. Okay, I think with that, we're gonna move on to section three of the toolkit, which is building your system and best practices in the diversity toolbox. So I think um, as we're starting to run a little short on time, um, I think Eileen, I think I'm gonna to jump to you first. Um, I was wondering if you could talk um, about how at the University of Arizona, you've been able to create a competitive yet inclusive innovation program. Wow, that's really big. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Eileen. I use she, her pronouns. I am um, at the University of Arizona in our tech transfer office. And what we've been working on here, and a lot of my uh, coworkers are also on the call. So hi, everybody. We have been looking at different ways to reach out to different types of inventors. Um, like Karen mentioned in the chat, there was, how do we approach them? Do we say, you are, you know, you're an inventor, you're an innovator. And one of the first things we did was we had a program called Claim Your Seat at the Table, where it was a series of a uh, couple hour sessions. And we talked that, yes, you are an inventor. Many women think that, oh, I'm just a problem solver oh, I'm not here to, to you know, get remunerated for my work. I'm just solving these problems. And we were encouraging women to see themselves as inventors and then take the next steps that way. Um, one of the really effective programs we have implemented is an um, annual luncheon called World Changing Women. And I think it was at us, I'm, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name, talking about how, how do you encourage women who might not see themselves or might not feel comfortable. That was, we had our rock star women inventors who work with us come to lunch and bring somebody. We encourage them to bring um, maybe a grad student or a postdoc who's working with them, maybe a promising undergrad. And while we didn't say you had to bring another woman, we strongly encouraged you bring another female presenting person with you because that's really who we were trying to reach with this lunch. But we also brought university bigwigs. We had the provost, we had the director of that and the vice president of this. So they could see that we have these great women working with us. We have this great next generation working with us so that it wasn't just, oh, there's 24%. Oh, there's five new faculty. They could put faces. But it also encouraged the researchers in that look at all of these um, university bigwigs who are interested in your success. And it also put 
they were able to talk. You know, we had undergrads talking to the provost. We had people talking to people they would never have spoken with before, interdepartmental collaboration. And so that's been a huge thing. Um, and I think that's important that when we start out trying to solve this giant wicked problem of how to make our pipelines more diverse, it is a huge problem that we don't get intimidated. We don't try to bite off more than we can chew. I'm a huge proponent of what's the one thing. If you've heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about what is the first step? What is one thing I can do to solve this problem? And so we took the first step of having this luncheon, of having our claim your seat at the table program. Um, some further steps in our pipeline is a more, an expanded program to encourage more diverse groups, uh, not just women, but anyone who self-identifies as an underserved minority group member, how we can get them into our pipeline. We're starting a huge program, well, huge for me, um, encouraging more social innovation in our pipeline. And that's, we'll get away from some of our hard science stuff and really embrace more departments in our university who might not have considered what they do to be innovation or an invention. I just wrote curriculum for this. Well, that that can be considered. So I know if any of you have ever participated in the i program, we're all um, encouraging them to focus, to focus, to focus. Well, we're actually, you need to expand your aperture, move beyond engineering and pharmaceutical chemistry and all of that. See what the English department has to offer. See what the libraries have to offer. We have a a startup that came out of our libraries a few years ago that, you know, Yvonne worked on it. You, you have to be creative in your thinking. So um, those are my big things. That's what we did. It's take the first step, do what's the one thing you can do. Oh, there's my boss. Hi, Doug. <laughs> and um, what's the one thing? Where can you start? Don't try to tackle the whole problem. And that's where we are. I love Thanks, that. Abby. Um, oh, Liz, ahead. if you don't mind, I wanted to kind of share a comment. That, um, Eileen, you mentioned inviting them to bring someone along. Uh, we had an event where I offered that same thing. And um, they the postdoc said, no, I don't want to go. My professor should go because I don't want to take her spot. Um, and I was like, no, no, both of you can come. There's room for both of you to be part of yes. this. Um, but she said, I wouldn't have brought it up if I didn't feel comfortable telling you that. So I just want to sort of say that as a lesson that when you offer to have someone bring someone else along, make sure they realize that it's not an either or, that you, oh, yeah. you truly have room for everyone. There's definitely a, a bigger table. Don't put up a higher wall, build a bigger table. At our last event, um, my supervisor and I actually ended up sitting in a different room because we packed the room. The room held 40 and with Paul and I, it was 42. So we got to sit elsewhere. So next year we're gonna need a bigger room, which is outstanding. And I think there's um, a comment in the chart, uh, chat rather about how do I oh. start a claim your seat at your at a university? And I'm sure knowing you that you'd be willing to help anyone I would be answer your happy questions. To help. Um, high level, we got funding in addition to our I Corps grant, and that helped me pay for some targeted advertising. But what I really did was I relied on the kindness of strangers. I had volunteers. Uh, Karen came in virtually and spoke at one of our sessions. I had our local uh, angel investor CEO come in. I had people from uh, Golden Seeds VC funding come in. And that was very helpful. It was a low we didn't have a ton of money, 
So I couldn't pay any of these people. But what I found were people who were willing to, to help. So I had Karen, I had Molly from the USPTO, I had Joanne from Desert Angels, I had Kathy from Desert or uh, from Golden Seeds. I had my own I-Corps instructors teach a course, and I had people from inside my own um, organization teach and, and talk. And I would be happy to talk to any of you about the, the, the Claim Your Seat program. I will put my um, email in the chat. Uh, I can't type and talk at the same time, but it was... It, it was really a collaborative effort. And one of the things I think you'll find as you go through building a program or looking for help, there are people that will help you. If you don't know where to start, pull the attendance list from this event. I am guessing that most of the people in here would be happy to help if you want to start a program like Claim Your Seat or like the Columbia University's DICE program, or Ohio State's Reach for Commercialization. Now, they're funded by a REACH or an advance grant, which is a different thing, but you don't have to start out with a $50,000 grant. You can have a Zoom, conf a Zoom meeting and have some subject matter experts talk. You can start with small steps. I mean, just to add to that, I think that's a great point because that's one of the things that I've been really overwhelmed with over the years is, you know, I have a day job that keeps me super busy and um, I don't have the time or the funding to start a program, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So that's why one of the things that we've done is try to tweak our existing processes. Mm -hmm. Like we, I mentioned these goals and things like that to really change our behavior, to be more inclusive and to um, drive more engagement. So I think that's that's important to think about if if thinking about setting up um, a program or events is is overwhelming because of lack of resources. Oh yeah, definitely. Another way you could start um, for your hiring, make sure that your job descriptions are accurate and inclusive. Do you really need a PhD for that position? Or would somebody who doesn't have a PhD be just as good? Because what studies show is people, women especially, are harder on themselves when they go to apply for a job. And that's a whole different discussion. But yeah, starting with your own policies and procedures in-house is a great way to expand your reach. Great. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that and for all the great comments and discussion. And uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. And I know Elodie Carpenter from WIPO is on the line. And I thought this would be a great opportunity for her to talk about um, leveraging a global perspective and share with us a little bit about what WIPO is doing, um, particularly as it relates to uh, women inventors and other uh, EDI initiatives. So Elodie, thank you so much for joining us and I will turn it over to you. Hi Lisa, hi everyone. Um, I've met some of you, not many, but uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. We've been doing quite a lot at WIPO. Um, I haven't really very much prepared, so it's going to be a little bit messy, but I hope I can cover everything we're doing. Um, so basically we have a gender champion, Lisa Jorgensen, um, that's making sure that we are spreading the word about everything we're doing. Um, and she's also convincing member state to do something about the gender issue in innovation. And I am on the back end of the story. So I'm the researcher who does the numbers, who does the magic with all the data dictionaries and, and all these things. So we just uh, published a report in March that you may have heard about or may not, but if you're interest, interested in, um, well, for the US, uh, for the US and academia, you also have all the resources from the USPTO in your case. Uh, but if you also want to, to look at a more global perspective, then we have more numbers. 
um, and I'm doing all the research. So if you have any question that you would like to see answered, I'm the person who can make it happen, maybe. Um, and so feel free to reach out. I can put my name just afterwards, my email in the in the chat box if you want to reach out and discuss or I'm always happy to discuss about um, women in IP. We've been intending to expand the research to go a bit more than just gender. Um, unfortunately, I saw a comment mentioning considering uh, gender as a um, broader, um, how do you say that? Um, not just the binary gender, but incorporate other definition or broader definition. Unfortunately, we're working with um, gender that we infer from the name. So that's very hard to go beyond, beyond. If we were using survey of people reporting their gender in a broader set, that would be fantastic. But we, we're struggling still to get IP offices to collect the gender at the origin from the from the inventor themselves. So it's not yet there. Maybe one day, I really hope it will, uh, but we're not there yet. And we're trying also to do some research on race or income, but again, that's really tough to, to do on a large scale. Um, we also have, I don't know if Ekaterini managed to be connected. I know that she was really intending to, but she's, she's also at WIPO and they are uh, with Christine Schlegelmisch, they're really working hard to um, implement our gender work plan. So inside the organization, we're trying to make sure that everyone um, gets the same opportunity. And um, and that's all I could think of. Maybe Lisa, you can think of something else or anyone. No, else? I think you hit you hit everything, Elodie. Thank you. Great. Thanks for giving me the floor. Well, we have a few minutes left, about three minutes. If anyone has any questions or has some comments or other things, maybe something they want to ask Elodie, please feel free to speak up and um, share your thoughts or your questions. I was just going to thank Elodie because um, she offered uh, for Autumn community members uh, to run their gender um, dictionary for you. So essentially what you would have to do is send her a list of the first names of your inventors that submitted invention disclosures or new patent filings, and they could um, use their dictionary to create those predictions for you as a place to start if you're not currently able to um, track that or submit your data to the autumn um, uh, yearly survey. So thank you, Elodie. That's right. <clears throat> Anybody have anything else? I, I have a, maybe one last thought, Lisa. Um, Absolutely. Two, min two minutes Close left. Close this out, Marges. I, I was wondering if anyone have a thought about how can we, we talked mainly about uh, women programs and women um, incentives, et cetera. If you have any thoughts about, um, other underrepresented group, how we can uh, create programs, do incentives, and etc. It's <laughs> we have one minute left, but feel free to reach out to all the speakers, all the members, and we can we hopefully we can continue the discussion beyond this water cooler. And thank you all for attending. That I, was I my think... question for everyone. <laughs> for myself and everyone and globally don't we don't forget the global perspective yeah that was it did someone have a comment i think, I think chad was making a comment there yeah I, I, we got really excited because we i mentioned it in the comments but we're going to meet with all of our employee resource groups and figure out what messaging might work with them and how we might engage them more. And then if they have any data, they can report that. Um, maybe we can survey them to see how many inventors they have and if that number grows every year. And I'd like to add something just really quickly um, to jump off on what Narjus talked about. 
with what's happening with other underrepresented groups. There are actually some really great programs that we don't have time to talk about right now. But I think with Lisa, I can say that we'll raise our hand and put together either a newsletter article or something that highlights some of the ph phenomenal work that's going on that's specifically focusing on other underrepresented groups in, in addition to what's happening with gender. That'd be great. Thank you, Karen. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Thank you all so much for participating today. Um, it was great. Thank you to all our speakers um, and Elodie for staying up extra late. And um, Arlene, if there were some great conversations in the chat. If we could find some way to save that, that would be great. And I wish everybody a great night. And thank you again for participating. I'm so sorry, but I need a, an explanation of about the. Is there any certificate of or uh, and records will be sent for us by email for attending the records so at first and RM, the certificate? Yeah, in your autumn profile, you'll be able to see all the webinars that you attended. Okay, and uh, is there any certificates for the attendance? Not that I'm aware of. Arlene, Colleen? No, no certificate, but we will share the recording. Okay, thank you so much. And Arlene, maybe I can follow up with you about how to send out our step-by-step um, -step guide and our in-depth guide um, to all the attendees. Would you be the right person? Yes, send it over. Okay, thank you so much. Great. And I'm I'm going to make a plug for the various SIGs that are on the Autumn website. We can also carry on these discussions there um, asynchronously through typing. But there is the diversity and inclusion SIG. There is the women inventors SIG. There's something for everybody there. So go and see what group piques your fancy and join and start and start the conversation you want to hear. Thank you, Eileen. That's great. All right, everybody, have a great night and thank you again. Bye. Thanks, Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.